Welcome to another episode of the Collective Evolution Podcast here. I uh, had a bit of a guest cancellation this week, so I'm going to be uh, kind of doing an episode here that is based on some stuff that I've been just kind of throwing together in terms of notes over the last week. As I watched a panel discussion of a, a number of, of great sort of, you know, prominent independent journalists, um, I won't name their names off the top, I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. Um, but I, I saw that in this panel discussion, so it was it was kind of about, you know, should we trust Elon Musk and um, and this and sort of this question of like the Twitter files and what's going on there. And um, it, it perhaps raised the question of like, are the Twitter files happening sort of as a way to get everybody to see Elon Musk as this next like, you know, billionaire savior? Um, and that's kind of the, the agenda or the play is that you get this billionaire savior to come in and gather up all these alternative folk into uh into trusting him so that the transhumanistic agenda can uh, can push forward and we can get the great reset and so on and so forth and um you know that's kind of what's being presented in, in this discussion of, of can we trust elon musk as these um these journalists sort of put together this panel discussion and i, I had a number of like you know ways in which i would love to have critiqued i wish i was on the panel to sort of discuss and push back on a number of the things that were being said because um it it kind of felt like an echo chamber of of narrative capture that was that was taking place, and I thought that it would be really interesting to bring up all the holes that were really in the theories that were being presented. As from my perspective, this was a a video that was kind of like condescending anybody who doesn't just believe what is being said on this panel, um, and sort of like pushing it in in such a way where it's like, look. It's so obvious that Elon Musk is purely a bad man, that nothing good can come of, of what he's doing and that everything is, is just an agenda and he's actually just controlled opposition and so on and so forth. And um, and there was so many things that were just paradoxical that didn't make sense. And um, I think it just illustrated a, a way in which narrative capture is, is creating so much noise in the information landscape and is making it hard to have meaningful discussions with various types of people. Um, around the current events that are taking place in our world. And what I mean by noise is that what, when I write about Elon Musk and, and this Twitter file story and I see comments, you know, where I can tell somebody hasn't even read the article that I wrote and seen what I said about it, yet they're saying, you know, this is all an agenda, this is controlled opposition, and they're, they're running all of this nonsense um, at, you know, in response. And, and I, will, I will question them like, yeah, but did you read the article? Yeah, but yeah, but what about this? Yeah, but what about that? And you and and you can tell that they have not considered any of these questions, and they just keep coming back with more rhetoric and more rhetoric and more rhetoric. Which is, Elon Musk is always bad. There's no other way to interpret it, and you know that's it. That's all. And of course, my content is saying, don't trust Elon Musk. I'm not suggesting you trust Elon Musk at all. I'm I'm asking you to take a step back and look at what's what's happening, with regards to so many things related to the Twitter files, so many things related to Elon Musk, and. What is being shown? What are we learning? What are we seeing? How might this benefit this, you know, this group of people here over here waking up to something? Um, and maybe this group of people over here has a new, you know, amount of evidence now to support the theories they've had for a long time about censorship. Um, but like, really, can you take a step back and look at what's happening? And um, when I find that a lot of people can't, they can't take that step back. They're stuck in their narrative of just sort of pessimism and, and seeing Elon Musk as just this bad, 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 bad person, no matter what. Um, I, I think to myself, where does this come from, right? Why, why are we in a position where we're foregoing sense-making? We're, we're not looking deeper. We're not trying to see what's going on. Instead, we want to be certain about a narrative and always be certain and then fill all of the information that we gather, everything that we see that happens in the world around us. We're forcing through this narrative, even when it doesn't fit. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today as we had a guest cancellation and this is what we're going to be doing now <laughs> so that I'd have an episode. Um, so I want to start it off with, uh, you know, again, I, I don't want to talk about necessarily, you know, who the folks were on, on this panel discussion, because I'm not here to, to call anybody out. This is about concepts. This is about empowering us to ask better questions, not assassinating other people or, or, you know, saying these people are not good journalists. I think every single journalist on this panel was a, is a great journalist. Um, I just, like I said, I felt like there was um, there was pieces to the puzzle that would have really benefited in a conversation from uh, just more balance and more discussion back and forth. And um, um, I think it's important that as an alternative media audience, we don't get caught up in 
following any particular source and saying, well, this is the best source and th these are the people and I trust these people all the time or whatever it might be. But, but really starting to notice sources where, uh, you know, these sources are willing to change their opinions. They're willing to admit when they don't know things, they're willing to, um, you know, sort of acknowledge both sides of an argument. They're, um, you know, they're, they're comfortable with the uncertainty of something, but are asking good questions and are seeing where the evidence leads. And they're not trying to manipulate their audience to see things in a particular way and, and, and get caught up in this narrative capture, which happens to be a very profitable way of, of going about making money is, is through narrative capture. But it's not leading to good sense making. And we talk about that in episode three of this podcast, which you can check out. I, I talk about this issue a lot of how so much of what's happening in, in media right now is is not built around us becoming really good critical thinkers, but around us, you know, getting caught up in narratives and and whether it's alternative or mainstream or whatever it might be. But but being in this space where somebody else is gonna do the thinking for us, then then we kind of take this in. Uh, and, and hold it as our ideology. And then every time we see a piece of information, we check with our ideology and see what's going on there. Um, and I think we need to get out of that, which is why we've we've you know created a number of resources in our membership, including a Overcoming Bias and Improving Critical Thinking course, which basically empowers people to think more clearly about independent media, mainstream media, you know, anything that they're reading or looking at and, and even notice their own biases. And a lot of the feedback that we got from this particular course is that people felt significantly more free in the way that they looked at information. Not only were they looking at information, you know, more effectively, but they felt more free to see different sides and different perspectives of things. Um, so that's there, uh, join.explorelounge.one if you want to go check that out. But um, let's get on to the the topic at hand here. So um, like I mentioned before, this uh, this panel discussion was really exploring this question of, of Elon Musk, the Twitter files, and um, a number of the conclusions that were being drawn really kind of rubbed me the wrong way because they didn't match the pattern through which most things are, are occurring. And I felt like there was a lack of acknowledgement of how this pattern did not make any sense whatsoever. So here's what I mean by that. You know, typically what we see in so much of how the mainstream is trying to control a narrative is we see them getting either very, very involved or we see a media blackout. So let's say something happens and the media wants to start and control the narrative first. They will get on it early and they will start, you know, perpetuating a particular narrative about something early uh, to sort of seed the mass consciousness with a way to think about something. Um, an example of that is the way CNN covered, um, you know, sort of the FBI Twitter file stuff is they, they wrote a piece that was essentially saying, um, you know, the Twitter files are basically a nothing burger. The, the FBI did not pay, um, uh, you know, Twitter to censor people. Um, they, it, as in, like, they didn't bribe them to, to censor people. Um, therefore, you know, what Elon Musk is saying about the Twitter files is nonsense. When you actually read the piece, you could tell that this author is, this is from one month ago, is almost desperately trying to seed into the, to the narrative of, of the public at the time that this story of, of the Twitter files and, and the FBI's involvement in, in paying Twitter is not worth looking at because it's not really true. Um, but when you actually look more closely, the CNN article down closer to the bottom is essentially saying they, they paid them, they paid Twitter money to uh, basically pay them for their time of going through and collecting data and censoring people. So they didn't bribe them to censor people. They, they paid them for their time to go through and collect data and, and do this stuff, right? And so it's like, it's this, it's this headline that's like trying to almost like manipulate people into thinking, well, this is, you know, this is not really a legit story. But it, it still is exactly what the Twitter files show, which is that the FBI got involved in paying Twitter to go and censor people, but they're paying them for their time. They're, it's not a bribe. You know what I'm saying? So you can see how this, like, it's this slight, subtle manipulation in media trying to get a hold of the narrative. But when you look at the larger picture of what the mainstream media is talking about when they're looking at the Twitter files, is there's very little discussion about it. it, it you know, most of the discussion goes back a month ago. There has been so many drops uh, of these Twitter files you know, over the last, you know, month and a half. And the mainstream media is pretty much not talking about it. You would call this a media blackout, right? And when they do talk about it, it's either Fox News talking about how, you know, it's basically showing that, you know, they were meddling 
Um, the governments were meddling with social media in trying to censor and control narratives around COVID-19. Um, or you see that, you know, they're, they're just, again, they're trying to downplay it as it's not really a big deal. Like, just don't talk about it. And then the rest of it is just a blackout. And so the pattern is typically that when you have a media blackout or when, you know, you know, they're, they're trying to control a very specific, specific narrative, you know that there's something wrong with this situation, right? The mainstream doesn't know what to say about it. The mainstream doesn't know what narrative to go with. And it's usually because the evidence at hand, especially in the case of the Twitter files, is so clear on what's going on. It's what people talked about this whole time. People were claiming during COVID-19 that credentialed scientists and credentialed uh, doctors and people that were sharing peer-reviewed journal, even when people, when, when they were taking screenshots of CDC data and saying, look, the data says that you know, children are not at risk of COVID-19 and then posting that on Twitter. And then Twitter says, oh, but this is misleading information. It's like, it's the CDC's own data. How is this misleading, right? The CDC's data says that kids are not at risk of COVID-19. You know, they're, they're not dying on mass yet. The narrative in the media is that it's hyper danger to kids, right? So it doesn't line up. And then Twitter's there censoring, right? So all these things that people were talking about during COVID we're now, we have the receipts now. We now have the, the data, the hard evidence that that's exactly what was going on. And this is why the mainstream media doesn't want to talk about this because they were on the side of calling out all these quote unquote conspiracy theories that now these receipts show that, yeah, the mainstream media was essentially irresponsible in the way they were projecting a level of certainty about how wrong all of these alternative perspectives and these anti-vax perspectives were. Um, when really they were they were correct in their assessments of it and the mainstream media just didn't look close enough and what i'm saying with regards to these twitter files and this panel discussion that i watched is that the alternative folks there are kind of doing the same thing now they're trying to undermine these twitter files undermine the independent journalists that are um, bringing these twitter files out because the narrative to them is that these twitter files are only here because they're trying, somebody is trying to make Elon Musk look like a savior and wrap everybody up into this transhumanistic agenda. But the evidence doesn't really support that entirely. Yes, you can look at all of this data, which I totally agree with. You can look at you know, Elon Musk's past connection with uh, World Economic Forum, uh, the Young Leaders um, <clears throat> sort of education program that he's gone through, as, as with many, many other people. Um, when it comes to the World Economic Forum, you can look at all of these pieces of the puzzle with regards to AI, with um, brain implants, and all these pieces that make Elon Musk seem like a technocratic sort of elite that is trying to um, push forth this transhumanistic agenda to some extent. Whatever that looks like depends on how you see things. And I think all of that is true. I think the evidence suggests that we should be weary of Elon Musk. We shouldn't be trusting Elon Musk blindly. Nobody should. Just as nobody should trust what I'm saying. Nobody should trust what those journalists were saying. Nobody should trust. You have to look at the data. You have to look at the information for yourself and, and be open to what is occurring. But what we're seeing here is, is like this narrative that Elon Musk is just being positioned as a savior. Well, who's positioning him as a savior? This is, this is what I'm curious about because one of the ways in which these alternative journalists were just saying you're an idiot if you believe that Elon Musk could do anything of value um, is they'll just say, well, you know, you have you look at all this Elon Musk fanboying that's going on out there because of the Twitter files. And it's like, well, from what I'm seeing, the mainstream media is not presenting Elon Musk as a savior. Inst instead, they're just assassinating this guy as one of the worst humans out there. They're avoiding, there's a media blackout on the Twitter files almost entirely. They won't talk about it, which doesn't match the trend that normally is, is out there when they're trying to create a narrative. On the alternative side of, the, of, of information, when you're looking at what Elon, what, how they're covering Elon Musk, most people are like, well, we're pretty weary of Elon. We don't know what to make of this sort of rogue billionaire. We don't really know what he's doing. We don't know what he's up to. We don't know what his agenda is. We don't know why he bought Twitter. We don't know if he's truly committed to free speech or if he's not. But... What's coming out right now with regards to the Twitter files is revealing what we were all thinking behind the scenes. And millions of people are waking up to the reality of their government meddling with big tech as a result of these receipts that are coming out, this, this evidence that's coming out. Yet these journalists were saying, don't pay attention to the Twitter files. There's no point in paying attention to the Twitter files because it's all an agenda to get everybody caught up in Elon Musk saviorism. But I just don't see that happening. And I don't see very many people, if if any at all, really promoting that narrative. What I see is some people having a sense of hope that it's possible that 
truth may be coming to the surface and that it's possible that Elon could be, um, in, in this instance, doing something that could be helpful, right? So again, you have a spectrum of Elon Musk and his actions that are, you know, um, potentially trying to protect free speech and bring more free speech to Twitter. You have this discussion around Tesla Motors, you have this discussion around, you know, environmentalism, you have this discussion around uh, transhumanism, you have, you have all these different discussions that Elon Musk is somehow a part of, going to space, so on and so forth. And people are trying to take the entirety of what Elon Musk is and, and use it to just eliminate, so take one aspect of him and use it to eliminate every aspect of him. Don't pay attention to anything because it's an agenda, because he does this one thing over here or, this, or these two things over here that are not that favorable. That suggests that for sure this Twitter file is just an agenda to manipulate your perspective and, and make you think that something good is happening when really it's not really something good is not happening, right? And it's it's kind of like, I don't know why there's this level of just constant pessimism that's always sort of impacting what's going on. And that if you were to acknowledge the possibility that even if this was an agenda, most people are really not in a position where they're all out trusting Elon Musk and are willing to, you know, give up on the guy the moment he goes in a direction that is not favorable. That's what I'm seeing all over the internet. That's what I, even one of the journalists that gave him, that, that he gave the Twitter files to, Barry Weiss, the moment Elon started censoring people on Twitter as a result of, of a few things that happened, she immediately wrote a piece saying, what the heck, Elon? Like, I, you said you were about free speech and then now you're doing this, right? So it just goes to show like these journalists and their audiences are seeing that there's a level of critical thought here that, that there's this narrative around Elon Musk being always bad and this like savior narrative is not black and white. And, and I'm, I'm very concerned when I see so many alternative journalists adding so much noise, so much confusion, so much like just pessimism to the discussion around what's happening. When really this is, in my view, an incredible opportunity to bring millions more people into the fold of questioning the very underlying systems of government, the underlying systems of big tech, and seeing the corruption that exists all the way down to the core. And I don't think any of these people are going to be like, well, because Elon revealed this, we should make him president, right? Nobody's, nobody's doing that, right? Instead, we have an opportunity to be like, look, Elon Musk is virtually irrelevant in this case. What's relevant is what this data shows. That's what's relevant, right? And my concern is that conversation is not being had. That Those opportunities to engage with all of these other millions of people who are waking up to this is, is kind of being thrown away by a large group of people that are now working against what so much of alternative media is saying because they're believing that this is all just an agenda. It's all just controlled opposition. It's all just an agenda. Meanwhile, the evidence doesn't really support that through and through, right? You may think or not agree with Elon in some regards, and that's totally fine. But there's a lot of really intelligent people who are just seeing what's happening with these Twitter files as an opportunity to, to wake up a whole other group of people, right? And to bring them into a larger discussion around what really is the true nature of the systems and the government and you know the world that we're living in, right? That's a huge piece to this puzzle. And how I know that there's something odd going on in that panel discussion, which again, I'm not saying there's any agenda to it. I'm saying... They, they, they went after the journalists that were given the Twitter files by Elon Musk as, as if those journalists can't be trusted because they're somehow part of an, an elite or part of the agenda as well, right? Like Matt Taibbi and Barry Weiss, you know, you can't trust either of them because, you know, Barry Weiss is potentially connected to the Israeli intelligence and Elon Musk is, or sorry, uh, Matt Taibbi is, um, he once said that, you know, conspiracy theorists are, you know, are dickwads or not to be trusted or whatever it was. So it's like, okay, so somebody said something in the past and therefore, you know, we can't trust anything that they're saying, right? What if he changed his mind? We have so many journalists over the last little bit who they, they had the straw that broke the camel's back over the last couple of years. They were mainstream journalists. They got fed up with the agendas, with the nonsense, with the this, with that, and they couldn't stay quiet anymore. And they went and started being alternative. Barry Weiss is one of those people. So you have two options right? Potentially two. Let's just do it for the sake of the thought experiment here. 
you know, Matt Taibbi, Barry Weiss, and all these other mainstream journalists who have left and now gone alternative or independent did that because they saw the problems in mainstream media and are now, I'm not doing this anymore. I've say woken up to certain truths and I'm now going to move forward in a new direction. Or maybe they're just part of an agenda and they were secretly like, you know, in a, in a back room told, Hey, you know what? You guys are, are part of the way in which, you know, you're only going to put out the information we want and you're not going to put out everything else. You're just going to put out the little bits of information that we want. And, uh, and, 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 you know, you're going to, you're going to suck all these alternative people into seeing things your way in this controlled way. Right. And that's, and that's what's going on. One of these things it potentially is, is true right now. If, if it's true that these mainstream media journalists left mainstream and are now independent because they see a problem and they see that they want to go in a new direction, um, then that's great. You're seeing a process to which they're waking up. They're starting to see things in a different way. And it might take them time to get to the level of research and the level of understanding that maybe people who've been doing this for 15 years are doing it, but it doesn't mean they're part of an agenda. It doesn't mean that they're being used to bring about some great reset nonsense. It's you have to treat that them in that situation with critical thinking and the openness that this that's potentially what it could be. What evidence supports that that's what it is versus what evidence supports that, well, they're just, they're just being used as controlled opposition, right? It's very, very easy, and might I add very lazy, to just say, well, that person's controlled opposition because I, because I think so or because, you know, this happened or because that happened. But when you look at the whole and you're willing to look at all the evidence and you're willing to look at everything that's there and just be comfortable with the uncertainty that you can't know for sure. You can't know for sure what the intentions of those people are. Instead, you can take their actions moment by moment and you can see, is there something potentially, you know, positive happening here? Like what, what did people always want in the alternative space? They always wanted good, clear, undeniable evidence that could be shared with millions of people to help them realize the true nature of the government, corruption, you know, um, what's going on with corporate influence, what's going on with technocratic agendas, what's going on with great, with the good, good, good evidence. As far as the Twitter files, that's exactly what we have. We now can see Scott Gottlieb and his lobbying to shut down conversations around COVID vaccines. You know, former Pfizer executive was on mainstream media all over the place saying, you know, natural immunity is garbage. Now we see he emailed Twitter, literally trying to force them to get rid of um, anybody who was talking about COVID vaccines online. This is the exact evidence, the exact meddling that we've been looking for as good, good, good evidence that can that nobody can deny. Waking up millions of people. Why are we trying to downplay this by saying this is just a this is this is a nothing burger. This is just, you know, people getting caught up in Elon Musk saviorism. Maybe to you, but to these people over here that are just kind of starting to find their feet on seeing a different side of the world, seeing a different narrative, this is actually very, very, very helpful information. And one day, now that they've maybe, you know, started to open up to this stuff, they can continue their critical thinking and maybe go a little deeper and see some of the other parts of corruption that exist that, you know, that, that you as a journalist who've been doing this for 15 years has been presenting, but without them learning about what's going on with the Twitter files, they may not get to the work that you present. Right. But there's this tendency to be like, well, the, you know, the Twitter files aren't, it's not awake enough. You know, it's not, it's not presenting the whole picture. Therefore it's, you, you know, there's, there's no point. It's Elon Musk is a bad man. You know, don't pay attention to the Twitter files. Right. And I'm, I'm seeing this, like, you know, what is really going on? in this, this desire to just shoot down everything related to the Twitter files. What is this desire? Like, are we, are we afraid? Like, are people afraid that, you know, you have some semblance that, hey, maybe some truth is coming out and this is good, and that we're, but we're about to be let down. So to protect ourselves from feeling let down, we got to shit on everything Elon's doing right now. We got to shit on everything that's Twitter files related. I don't know. Is that what's going on? Is there like jealousy that the, these people weren't the ones to break the Twitter file story? I have no idea. I'm not going to suggest that it's one thing or another. What I'm suggesting is that the script is being lost, that there's a, a ton of potential for people to see what's going on here. And instead of just kind of acknowledging that, there's just all this noise being added, right? Like I, I write something about the Twitter files and I see all these comments of people being like, 
the it, controlled opposition, don't pay any attention, blah, 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 all this stuff. But, and it's like, you try and talk to these people, and it's like talking to a wall. It's like you're talking to somebody who can't even compute evidence versus, you know, hypothesis, right? And what is that? That's a result of narrative capture. That's a result of, I don't care what the evidence says. My narrative is this, and therefore, that's the only way in which I see the world, right? So there's no freedom there. There's, you're, you're seeing things through your lens. You can't even communicate effectively to people because Twitter files, but over here, World Economic Forum, young leader, therefore, don't trust Twitter files, right? But it's like, hold on a second. No one's asking you to trust Elon Musk. Just remove Elon from the situation for a second. Just look at the Twitter files. What is it showing? Evidence of corruption and collusion. So let that be the story. And at, you know you can put in there. I, I don't trust Elon. I, I you know I think we should be critical of Elon because look at his billionaire status. Maybe that maybe that means something. Look at his his connection with some of these other agencies. <clears throat> we should we should think critically about that. You know, but instead it's just don't trust anything because you know he's he's a Tony Stark. Um, but you know, he's a good guy. He's a, he's a good guy billionaire trying to save the world. It's like, nobody's even saying that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, so it's like, you know, my take is, it's like, we have to be willing to kind of see the signal, leave, leave out the noise. And it, in my opinion, just be responsible as content creators and content consumers to admit what we know and admit what we don't know and stop trying to be so like certain on exactly what is happening and pretending like we know people's intentions when we don't know their intentions, right? It's great to think critically and to look at some pieces to the puzzle. But when you're condescending towards people saying that if you even consider that something good is happening, you're still asleep, you're still an idiot, you just don't get it, right? Then we're starting to lose the reality of what's going on and we're creating more noise and we're not really advancing the conversation in a reasonable and meaningful way, we're just stuck in narrative. We're just stuck in, in, in seeing things through our lens. What I don't want to see happen is people shut down their inquiry. They're, they're taking a closer look at the situation because, you know, some of their favorite journalists have said, you know, don't believe anything Elon is saying with regards to the Twitter files and with regards to this stuff because, you know, it's just a transhumanist agenda, right? Talk about transhumanist agenda. Do whatever you feel like. But the reality of the situation is there is still good that can come of this, right? There are still some positives that we can take away from what's going on with these Twitter files. And I, I don't think that we, we necessarily should be seeking to, to, to create audiences that are super caught up in seeing things through one lens and through one way. And it's like, believe us, or you're just kind of an asleep, you know, idiot who watches too much YouTube, right? Um, I just don't see how that is helping to add to the um, the general conversation out there uh, in, in a meaning in a meaningful way. But um, that's it. That's all. Again, we, you know, my, my focus here is, is I wanted to just provide some thoughts on this piece. I don't know. I know a lot of people watch this, this, this panel discussion. Um, again, I'm not naming the names. I'm not going through that because there's just been too much drama over the course of the last 15 years in this space with regards to, um, you know, if you say something negative about somebody, you're controlled opposition. You say something negative about somebody, oh my God, you know, but it's like, no one's even saying anything negative, right? That's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm literally just trying to say that at the end of the day, I think it's important that we're responsible with our word and that we're, we're doing our best to create a situation where we're creating audiences that are open, that are curious, that are being, you know, that are able to hold a conversation about a particular subject without it just resorting to, oh, don't believe anything. That's all controlled opposition. Oh, well, that's all nonsense. Like there's tons of people that I cannot converse with uh, in my own audience at times because there's this absolutism that has, you know, there's, there, there's just a shell there of absolutism that doesn't allow there to be a consideration of other ideas. And I think this is, you know, that's a place where you don't want to be, right? If you're caught up in a mainstream absolutist narrative or you're caught up in an alternative absolutist narrative, it's the same problem on both sides, right? We, we got to be able to look at what's going on, communicate effectively, you know, get into a situation where we can um, make sense of things without just being totally caught up in, in a narrative. Um, 
And that's pretty much it. Anyway, just to summarize, again, I, I, I did, this wasn't necessarily meant to be a piece that was was supposed to be saying, hey, look, all these journalists are wrong or, or this, that, whatever. It's an appeal to being able to be okay with uncertainty and, and, and being careful not to dive into these narratives where we're so absolute. Like when I see independent journalists assassinating other independent journalists saying, don't listen to anything, they're saying they can't be trusted for flimsy, flimsy reasons. And because it, it, it it's like an attempt to hold on to a narrative that is very black and white, that, that acknowledges that there's no nuance, there's no uh, sort of, if our world is not good guys versus bad guys. That's not our world, right? You can believe that that's our world and that's fine. But uh, you know, if you really take a step back and you look at things, things are a lot more complex than that. And when I see this desperation to hold on to the good guy, bad guy narrative and throw at evidence and sort of use flimsy evidence to paint people as bad so that you can hold on to the good guy, bad guy narrative. Then I start seeing issues in the way information is being presented. And I, I, I want viewers to be able to think critically and notice like, hey, what is going on in that discussion that is that is pushing people into this, you know, believe everything that, that I have to say. Otherwise, you know, you're asleep. Like the moment somebody is trying to say, somebody's trying to like offend or is trying to sort of shut down dialogue by saying, well, if you don't believe me, then then you just don't get it. Um, the moment that starts to happen, you know that that there's a there's a protection there, that the, that the person is most likely not super duper clear on what it is that that they what, that what they're saying doesn't have the evidence, the strength of the evidence that is required, and is just trying to say, well, look, I know my evidence kind of sounds weak, but you know, you're an idiot if you don't believe me, right? That's that's kind of how it sounds to me. Um, but I just wanted to bring up some of these points. Curious to hear some of your thoughts. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, we we produced our, our mission is to produce as many people. Um, as possible that can think critically, that can look at the situation and be embodied, uh, you know, as they navigate news and information in their world and they, as they navigate the human condition, as we try and make sense of things as a group together and, and have conversations that are respectful and meaningful um, without just getting caught up in, in narrative capture and having to insult other people because, um, you know, at the end of the day, we just don't agree with them. Um, it should never resort to that. but. That's it. That's all. I mean, if you want to check, check out our bias course, uh, bias and critical thinking course, um, you can go to join.explorelounge.one. I'll put a link below um, and you can become a member. You can check it out. Uh, you know, again, I think in our this day and age right now, uh, it's a super important tool to be able to discern is what I'm saying full of nonsense and bias is what another journalist saying full of nonsense and bias. When I communicate to other people, am I like as in, you know, you, the individual, are you full of nonsense and bias, right? This course will help uh, to sort of bring light to that. But that's it. That's all. Uh, thanks so much for checking out this episode and we'll catch you next week.